When we left off our last lecture, we were talking about red giants. And we had this picture up. This is the same slide I ended the last one with. And we had helium fusing to carbon in the core of the star. And then we had a shell of hydrogen fusing into helium. And then we had the outer layers expanding vastly into space. Perhaps if this were the sun, maybe out as far as the Earth's orbit, because every time we started a new thing fusing, that gave a little outward kick to the outer layers, and they moved outward. So what happens when this is over? Eventually, all of that helium is going to be fused into carbon. And eventually, we're not going to be able to turn on any more shells and start them doing fusion of hydrogen to helium, because those shells are eventually going to be so far away that the gravity will be too weak to make them collapse enough to get the temperature and density necessary for fusion. So sooner or later, we completely run out of things to fuse. What happens then? That's where we're going in this lecture. And again, we need to look at the outer layers and the core separately. So I'm going to start with the outer layers. The outer layers are gradually separating away from the star because as you go further and further away from the core of the star, gravity is getting weaker and weaker. So you can almost think of this as the outer layers are evaporating into space. You did a calculation in your homework of the density of a red giant, and it's very, very, very small. It's thinner than air. And that is this gas that's expanding out into space. And that's what you're seeing in each of these pictures here. These are just four famous examples of what we're talking about here. There's a name for this expanding cloud of gas that's formed by the outer layers that are now detaching themselves from the star. And it's called a planetary nebula. Now, this has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with planets. This is one of the very few places in astronomy where the name does not actually fit what's going on. The early astronomers who first discovered these things thought that through their wimpy little telescopes, these things kind of looked like planets because they couldn't see the level of detail that we can see now. Um, so they said, well, they're nebulas. They knew they weren't planets, so they're nebulas. But they kind of looked like planets, so they called it a planetary nebula. It's a nebula that looks like a planet. A nebula, in general, is just a cloud of gas. We looked at the pillars of creation in class, and those are a nebula. It's just a cloud of gas in space. So the planetary nebula is what becomes of the outer layers. The core is a little bit more interesting. The core is going to become a white dwarf. And you remember white dwarfs from the HR diagram. They're that diagonal line down in the lower left where we have very hot but very faint things. Now, the big star in this picture is the star Sirius. Sirius is a main sequence star. It's a type A. It's about 10,000 degrees and very well known. It's the brightest star um, in the night sky. It's the star with the biggest apparent brightness. But if you look at this little dot down here, that's another star. And that's right at the same place where Sirius is. In fact, this little guy is actually orbiting Sirius. And it's a whole other star, but it is a white dwarf. So you get a sense of how small a white dwarf is compared to a big main sequence star. And this little companion is called Sirius B. It was the first white dwarf that was ever discovered. So what are white dwarfs? Well, the outer layers by now have expanded into space. So the inner part is just left sitting there by itself. That core is sitting there by itself. And by now, it is carbon. All of the helium in the core has now fused into carbon. And so the fusion has ended. The planetary nebula is gone. The core, which is carbon, is what we call a white dwarf. It's white because it's very, very hot. If you think about the temperature that it must have been right before we lost the planetary nebula, that was hot enough to fuse helium into carbon. That is ridiculously hot. It's very, very hot because it used to be the core of a star. 
but it's a dwarf because it's only the core, the outer layers are gone. And in fact, the typical size of a white dwarf is about the size of Earth. So Sirius B, for example, is just about the same size as Earth. Now, you might say, okay, wait a second, but Miss Cross fusion has ended and doesn't that mean we have a problem again? Because isn't gravity going to try to make this thing collapse? Anytime fusion shuts off, gravity is supposed to make it collapse. And gravity does want to make it collapse. But there is a new kind of pressure that comes up. The pressure that we had before was just pressure that you have from heat. And all hot gases have that. Well, we're not making any more of that anymore because we are cooling off. We aren't doing fusion anymore. But there is another kind of pressure. Uh, imagine for a second that you're going to get on an elevator with a couple of your friends. Well, okay, that's no big deal. If you only have two or three friends, you get on the elevator and no big deal. But suppose you have 12 friends and you all want to get on the elevator at the same time. You all want to get on the same elevator. Well, you're going to be kind of crammed in and you're going to be sort of pushing against the walls because there are going to be so many of you in the elevator. Electrons kind of act the same way. Electrons do not like to be squished too much. If you squish them too much, they start pushing back, just like you push against the walls of the elevator because you're being too crammed in with all of your 12 friends. This pressure that electrons make when you compress them too far is called electron degeneracy pressure. And this pressure is strong enough to balance out gravity and prevent the core from collapsing any further. So it just stops at the size of a white dwarf and it doesn't do anything else from then on. It just sort of sits there and cools and that's the end of it. That is going to be the fate of our sun. Our sun will in about five or six billion years become a white dwarf and it will just sit there cooling off. By that point, Earth won't exist anymore. Um, some of the outer planets may still be there, but anything that would have been on them, any life that might have been there, which we don't think there is, but if there were um, 10 billion years or 5 billion years from now, who knows, um, that would die too because the sun is gone. So um, the fate of the sun is kind of a sad, pitiful little thing. It blows off its outer layers in a pretty planetary nebula and then just sits there as a white dwarf and cools off. There is one exception to this sort of boring fate. Now what I'm about to talk about will not happen to the sun. It will not happen. But it could happen for a star like Sirius B. Some white dwarfs explode. What you see in this picture is another galaxy. This is a whole galaxy of 200 billion stars. And this is a single star that is in that galaxy and it is exploding. And this is called a supernova. A supernova is an exploding star and they are insanely bright. I mean, you notice this one star is as bright as the whole rest of this galaxy put together. This one star is as bright as the 200 billion stars that are in here all put together. And this happens to certain white dwarfs that are in binary systems. This is like Sirius where there's one star orbiting another. And let's imagine a situation like Sirius where one star is a white dwarf and the other one is a main sequence star, or it could also be a red giant. Now the white dwarf, despite being smaller, has more gravity. It's kind of surprising, but white dwarfs have more gravity because gravity depends on how dense you are. White dwarfs are very, very, very dense. And because it has more gravity, it actually starts sucking mass away from its companion. That's what you're seeing in this picture here. This is a artist's picture of that. So this is the white dwarf. This is the main sequence star. And the white dwarf is sucking in mass from its companion. So that means it's adding to its own mass. Now it turns out there's sort of a magic number here, which is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. In your book, you'll see this is called the Chandrasekhar limit, which is a really hard thing to spell. Um, 
that's named for the guy who came up with this. But this sort of magic number is 1.4 times the mass of the sun. When the mass gets that big, electron degeneracy pressure can't support the white dwarf against gravity. At that point, gravity wins. Gravity takes over and makes the core collapse. And because it happens very, very, very rapidly, the star actually blows itself up, completely explodes, because this is very unstable when this happens. It actually completely blows itself up. The explosion always happens exactly at the moment when it hits that mass of 1.4 times the mass of the sun. So originally it would have been much smaller. For instance, the sun will never be 1.4 times the mass of the sun. It's already less than that, and it doesn't have any companions to suck mass from. But Sirius B could do that. Whenever Sirius B starts taking mass from Sirius, and then it hits 1.4 times the mass of the sun, Sirius B will explode as a supernova. These are going to turn out to be very important later on. And in fact, these are going to demonstrate the acceleration of the expansion of the universe, which we'll talk about in a later unit. Very important thing actually won the Nobel Prize in physics last year. So this is something we're going to come back to that you just should know right now.